All of the actors you'll be hearing tonight are volunteering their time and talent from their homes to bring some entertainment into your homes. Many of them first met each other just 15 minutes ago when they logged into this Zoom meeting, whether it's for the first time, the 17th time, whether they're in any of the various United States, in Australia or in Denmark, we wanna thank them immensely for joining us. We'd also like to thank our friend, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare for hosting our readings on his pages and for joining us every now and again. We are excited for his upcoming production with the social distancing players of the Hamlet Christmas special. Check out his website at shakespeareapproves.com and his Patreon at patreon.com slash Shakespeare. We'll provide links to all of his comment, uh, content in the comments of this video. As always, we want to acknowledge and thank all of the medical, professional, pro medical professionals and essential workers who have been working tirelessly to keep us all as healthy and safe as possible. We also want to acknowledge those demonstrating and protesting for bravely pushing forward the simple fact that Black Lives Matter. If you are interested in more information about our totally volunteer organization, check out our website, zenithplayers.com. Feel very free to check out our very attractive donations page. 100% of all donations go towards production costs, which these days consists of the various subscriptions that allow for these readings to happen. If you'd like to read with us in future projects, just send us an email, casting at zenithplayers.com. We will get you on board. Join us this upcoming Monday, uh, July the 13th for Medea. And next Saturday, we will continue our Shakespeare series. For now, please relax and enjoy Comedy of Errors, featuring as Aegean, a merchant from Syracuse, Nat Genace, as Salinus, the Duke of Ephesus, Shakira Sur, as Antiphilus of Syracuse, a traveler in search of his mother and his brother, Steve Anderson, as Dromeo of Syracuse, his servant, Rebecca Martin, as the first merchant, a citizen of Ephesus, Zandali Montero, as Antiphilus of Ephesus, a citizen of Ephesus, Russell Slater, as Dromeo of Ephesus, his servant, Emily Durango. As Adriana, Antiphilus of Ephesus's wife, Caitlin Jurowitz. As Luciana, Adriana's sister, Julie Goska. Luce, also called Nell, will be played by Aaron Grotus Gimble, a messenger, a servant to Antiphilus of Ephesus and Adriana, Brian James Applegate. Angelo, an Ephesian goldsmith, will be played by Mira Singer. The second merchant, the citizen to whom Angelo owes money, is played by Zandali Montero. Balthazar, an Ephesian merchant, will be played by Brian James Applegate. And a courtesan, the hostess of Antipolis of Ephesus at dinner, will be played by Grace Aline. Dr. Pinch, a schoolmaster engaged as an exorcist, will be played by Aaron Grotus Gimble. An Ephesian law officer will be played by Bill Nutt. And the Lady Abbess, also called Amelia, head of a priory in Ephesus, will be played by Debbie Locke. Comedy of Errors, Act 1, Scene 1, Enter Salinus, the Duke of Ephesus, with Aegean, the Merchant of Syracuse, the Jailer, and other attendants. Proceed, Salinus, to procure my fall, by the doom of death and woes and all. Merchant of Syracuse, plead no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which have late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants our well-dealing countrymen, who, wanting guilders to redeem their lives, have sealed his rigorous statutes with their bloods, excludes all pity from our threatening looks. For since the mortal and intestine jars twixt thy seditious countrymen and us, it hath in solemn synods been decreed, both by the Syracusians and ourselves, to admit no traffic to our adverse towns. Nay more, if any born at Ephesus be seen at Syracusian marts and fairs, again, if any Syracusian born comes to the Bay of Ephesus, he dies, his goods confiscate to the Duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and to ransom him. Thy substance, valued at the highest rate, cannot amount unto a hundred marks. Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this is my comfort. When your words are done, my woes end likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusian, say in brief the cause why thou departest from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. A heavier task could not have been imposed. Then I to speak of my griefs unspeakable, yet that the world may witness that my end 
was wrought by nature, not by vile offense. I'll utter what my sorrow gives me leave. In Syracuse I was born and wed unto a woman happy but for me, and by me had not our hap been bad. With her I lived in joy, our wealth increased by prosperous voyages I often made to Epididium till my factor's death, and the great care of goods and random left drew me from kind embracements of my spouse, from whom my absence was not six months old before herself, almost at a fainting under the pleasing punishment that women bear, had made provision for her following me and soon and safe arrived where I was. There had she not been long, but she became a joyful mother of two goodly sons, and which was strange, the one like the other, as could not be distinguished but by names. That very hour in the selfsame inn, a mean woman was delivered of such burden male twins, both alike, those for their parents were exceedingly poor, I bought and brought up to attend to my sons. My wife, not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motions for our home return. Unwillingly, I agreed. Alas, too soon, we came aboard. A league of epidemium we had sailed. Before the always winding, obeying deep, gave any tragic instance of our harm. But longer did we not retain much hope. For what obscured light the heavens did grant, but convey unto our fearful minds a doubtful warrant of immediate death, which, though myself would gladly have embraced, yet the incessant weepings of my wife, weeping before what she saw must come, and pitiless paintings of the pretty babes that mourned for fashion, ignorant what to fear, forced me to seek delays for them and me. And this it was, for other means was none. The sailors sought for safety by our boat and left the ship, then sinking right to us. My wife, more careful with the ladder born, had fastened him unto a small spare mast, such as seafaring men provide for storms. To him, one of the other twins was bound, whilst I had been like heedful of the other. The children thus disposed, my wife and I, fixing our eyes on whom our care was fixed, fastened ourselves at either end of the mast, and floating straight, obedient to the stream, was carried towards Corinth, as we thought. At length the sun, gazing upon the earth, dispersed those vapors that offended us, and by the benefit of his wished light, the seas waxed calm, and we discovered two ships from far making a main to us, of Corinth that, of Epidaurus this, but ere they came. Oh, let me say no more. Gather the sequel by what I have said before. Nay, forward, old man, do not break off so, for we may pity, though not pardon thee. Oh, had the gods done so, I had not now. Worthily termed them merciless to us, for ere the ships could meet by twice five leagues, we were encountered by a mighty rock, which being violently borne upon our helpful ship was splitted in the mist, so that in this unjust divorce of us, fortune had left us both to alike. What to delight in, what to sorrow for, her part. Poor souls, seemingly as burdened with lesser weight, but not with lesser woe, was carried more speed than before the wind, and in our sight they became three were taken up by fishermen of Corinth, as we thought. At length, another ship had seized on, uh, upon us, and knowing whom it was in their hap to save, gave heedful welcome to their shipwrecked guests and would have reft the fishers a love their prey, had their not bark been so slow of sail, and therefore homeward they did bend their course. Thus you have heard me severed from my bliss, that my misfortunes, my life prolonged to tell sad tales of my own mishaps. And for the sake of them thou sorrowest for, do me the favor to dilate at full what hath befallen of them and thee till now. My youngest boy, and yet my eldest care, at 18 years became inquisitive after his brother and important to me that his attendant so was the case like, 
bereft of his brother, but restrained his name, might bear him company in the quest of him, whom whilst I labored a love to see, I hazarded the loss of whom I had loved. Five summers have I spent in farthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homeward came to Ephesus, hopeful to find, yet loath to leave unsought, or that, or any place that harbors men, but here must end the story of my life, and happy were I in my timely death, could all my travels warrant me to let they live. Hapless Aegean, whom the fates have marked to bear the extremity of dire mishap. Now, trust me, were it not against our laws, against my crown, my oath, my dignity, which princes would they may not disannul, my souls should sue as advocate for thee. But though thou art adjudged to the death, and passed sentence may not be recalled, but to our honour's great disparagement, yet I will favour thee in what I can. Therefore, merchant, I'll limit thee this day to seek thy life by beneficial help. Try all the friends thou hast in Ephesus. Beg thou or borrow to make up the sum, and live. If no, then thou art doomed to die. Jailer, take him to thy custody. I will, my lord. Hopeless and helpless doth Aegean queen, but to procrastinate his lifeless end. They exit. Act one, scene two. Enter Antiphilus of Syracuse, the first merchant, and Dromeo of Syracuse. Therefore, give out you are of epidamium, at least that your goods too soon be confiscate, this very day a Syracusian merchant is apprehended for arrival here, and not being able to buy out his life, according to the statute of the town, dies ere the wary sun set in the west. There's your money that I had to keep. Go, bear it to the centaur where we host, and stay there, Dromio, till I come to thee. Within this hour it will be dinner time. Till that I'll view the manners of the town, peruse the traders, gaze upon the buildings, and then return and sleep within my inn. For with long travel, I am stiff and weary. Get thee away. Many a man would take you at your word, and go indeed, having so good a mean. Romeo of Syracuse exits. A trusty villain, sir, that very oft when I am dulled with care and melancholy, lightens my humor with his merry jests. Why, will you walk about with me about the town and then go to my inn and dine with me? I am invited, sir, to certain merchants of whom I hope to make much benefit. I crave your pardon. Soon at five o'clock, uh, please you, I'll meet with you upon the mart, and afterwards consort you till bedtime. My present business calls me from you now. Farewell till then. I will go lose myself and wander up and down to view the city. Sir, I commend you to your own content. He exits. He that contends me to mine own content contends, commends me to the thing I cannot get. I to the world am like a drop of water, then the ocean seeks another drop. Falling there to find his fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. So I, to find a mother and a brother, in quest of them, unhappy, lose myself. Enter Dromeo of Ephesus. Here comes the almanac of my true date. What now? How chance thou art returned so soon? Return so soon? Rather approach too late. The cap on burns, the pig falls from the spit, the clock hath struck in twelve upon the bell, my mistress made it one upon my cheek. She is so hot because the meat is cold, the meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach, you have no stomach having broke your fast. But we know what tis to fast and pray, are pen penitent for your default today. Stop in your wind, sir, tell me this, I pray, where have you left the money that I gave you? Uh, sixpence that I had on uh, Wednesday last to pay the saddler for my mistress's cropper. The saddler had it, sir. I kept it not. I am not in a sportive humor now. Tell me, and dally not, where is the money? We being strangers here, how darest thou trust so great a charge from thine own custody? I pray you, jest, sir, as you sit at dinner. I from my mistress come to you in post. 
If I return, I shall be post indeed, for she will scour your fault upon my pate. Methinks your more, like mine, should be your clock, and strike you home without a messenger. Come, Dromio, come. These guests are out of season. Reserve them till the merrier hour than this. Where is the gold I gave in charge to thee? To me, sir. Wait, you gave no gold to me. Come on, sir knave, have done your foolishness, and tell me how thou hast disposed of thy charge. My charge was but to fetch you from the mart home to your house, the phoenix, to dinner. My mistress and her sister stays for you. Now, as I am a Christian, answer me in what safe place you have bestowed my money, or I shall break that merry sconce of yours that stands on tricks when I am indisposed. Where is the thousand marks thou hadst of me? I have some marks of yours upon my pate, some of my mistress's marks upon my shoulders, but not a thousand marks between you both. If I should pay your worship those again, perchance you will not bear them patiently. Thy mistress's mark? What mistress, slave, hast thou? Your worship's wife? My mistress at the Phoenix, she that doth fast till you come home to dinner and prays that you will hire you home to dinner. Why, to have thou flout me thus unto my face, being forbid? There, take you that, sir knave. What you mean you, sir? For God's sake, hold your hands. Nay, and you will not, sir. I'll take my heels. Romeo of Ephesus exits. Upon my life, by some device or other, the building is all wrought of all my money. They say this town is full of cousinage, as nimble jugglers that deceive the eye, dark working sorcerers that change the mind, soul killing witches that deform the body, disguised cheaters, praising mountebanks, and many such like liberties of sin. If it proves so, I will be gone the sooner. Out to the centaur to go seek this slave. I greatly fear my money is not safe. He exits. End of Act One. Act Two, Scene One. Enter Adriana, wife to Antiphilus of Ephesus, with Luciana, her sister. Neither my husband nor the slave returned that in such haste I sent to seek his master. Sure, Luciana, it is two o'clock. Perhaps some merchant hath invited him, and from the marts he's somewhere gone to dinner. Good sister, let us dine and never fret. A man is master of his liberty. Time is their master, <laughs> and when they see time, they'll go or come. If so, be patient, sister. Why should their liberty uh, than ours be more? Because their business still lies out o' door. Look, when I serve him, he takes it ill. Oh, no, he is the bridle of your will. <laughs> There's none but asses will be bridled so. Why headstrong liberty is lashed with woe? There's nothing situated under heaven's eye but half his bound in earth, in sea, in sky. The beasts, the fishes, and the winged fowls are their males, subjects, and their controls. Man more divine, the master of all these, lord of the wide world and wild what we sees, endued with intellectual sense and souls of more preminiscence than fish and fowls are masters to their females and their lords. Then let your will attend on their accords. This servitude makes you to keep unwed. Not this but troubles of the marriage bed. But were you wedded, you would bear some sway. Ere I learn love, I'll practice to obey. How if your husband starts some other where? Till he come again, I would forbear. Patience unmoved, no marvel though she pause. They can be meek that have no other cause. A wretched soul bruised with adversity. We bid be quiet when we hear it cry. But were we burdened with like weight of pain, as much or more we should ourselves complain. So thou that hast no unkind mate to grieve thee, with urging helpless patience would relieve me. But if thou lived to see like right bereft, this fool begged patience in thee will be left. Well, I will marry one day, but to try. Here comes your man. Now is your husband nigh. Enter Dromeo of Ephesus. 
Say, is your tardy master now at hand? Nay, he's at two hands with me, and that my two ears can witness. Say, didst thou speak with him? Knowst thou his mind? Aye, aye, he told his mind upon mine ear. Beshrew his hand, I scarce could understand it. Spake he so doubtfully, thou couldst not feel his meaning? Oh, nay, he struck so plainly, I could too well feel his blows, and withal so doubtfully that I could scarce understand them. But say, I prithee, is he coming home? It seems he hath great care to please his wife. Why, mistress, sure my master is horn-mad. Horn-mad, thou villain? I mean not cuckold mad, but sure he is stark mad. <laughs> when I desired him to come home to dinner, he asked me for a thousand marks in gold. Tis dinner time, quoth I. My gold, quoth he. Your meat doth burn, quoth I. My gold, quoth he. <laughs> Will you come, quoth I. My gold, quoth he. Where is the thousand marks I gave thee, villain? The pig, quoth I, is burned. My gold, quoth he. <laughs> My mistress. Sir, hang up thy mistress. I know not thy mistress. Out on thy mistress. Quoth who? Quoth my master. I know, quoth he, no house, no wife, no mistress. So that my errand due unto my tongue, I thank him, I bear home upon my shoulders. For in conclusion, he did beat me there. Go back again, thou slave, and fetch him home. Go back again and be new beaten home. For God's sake, send some other messenger. Back, slave, or I will break thy pate across. And he will bless that cross with other beating. Between you, I shall have a holy head. A hence, prating peasant, fetch thy master home. Am I so round with you as you with me that like a football you despair me thus? You spurn me hence, and he will spurn me hither. If I last in this service, he must case me in leather. Exits. Hi, hi. How impatience loreth in your face. His company must do his minions grace, whilst I at home starve for a merry look. Have homely age the alluring beauty took from my poor cheek? But then he hath wasted it. Are my discourses dull? Barren my wit, if voluble and sharp discourse be marred, unkindness blunts it more than marble hard. Do their gay vestments his affections bait? That's not my fault, he's master of my state. What ruins are in me that can be found by him not ruined? Then he is he the ground of my defeatures. My decayed fair, a sunny look of his would soon repair. But too unruly dear, he breaks the pail and feeds from home. Poor I am, but his stale. Self-harming jealousy, fie, beat it hence. Unfeeling fools can with such wrongs dispense. I know his eye doth homage otherwhere, or else what lets it but he would be here. Sister, you know he promised me a chain. Would that alone a love he would detain, so he would keep fair quarter with his bed. I see the jewel best enameled will lose his beauty. Yet the gold bides still that others touch and often touching will wear gold. Yet no man that hath a name by falsehood and corruption doth it shame. Since that my beauty cannot please his eye, I'll weep what's left away and weeping die. How many fond fools serve mad jealousy? They exit. Act two, scene two. Enter Antipholus of Syracuse. The gold I gave to Dromio is laid up safe for the centaur, and the heedful slave has wandered forth in care to seek me out. By computation, on my host, my host's report, I could not speak with Dromio, so I've, since at first I sent him for the mart. See, here he comes. Enter Dromio of Syracuse. How now, sir? Is your merry humor altered? As you love strokes, so jest with me again. You know no centaur, you receive no gold. Your mistress sent to have me home to dinner. My house was at the Phoenix. Was thou mad that thou so madly thou didst answer me? What answer, sir? 
when spake I such a word? Even now, see, even here, half an hour hence. I did not see you since you sent me hence, home to the centaur, with the gold you gave me. Philin, thou didst deny the gold's receipt, and toldst me of a mistress and a dinner, for which I hoped thou feltst I was displeased. I am glad to see you in this merry vein. What means this jest, I pray you, master, tell me. Yea, dost thou jeer and flout me in the teeth? Think'st thou I jest? Hold, take that and that. Well, oh, sir, for God's sake, now you're just as earnest. Upon what bargain do you give it me? Because that I familiarly sometimes do use you for my fool and chat with you, your sauciness will jest upon my love and make a comment of my serious hours. When the sun shines, let foolish gnats make sport, but creep in crannies when he hides his beams. If you will jest with me, know my aspect and fashion your demeanor to my looks, or I will beat this method in your sconce. Sconce, call you it? So you would leave battering. I had rather have it a head, and you use these blows long. I must get a sconce for my head and ensconce it too, or else I shall seek my wit in my shoulders. But I pray, sir, why am I beaten? Dost thou not know? Nothing, sir, but that I am beaten. Shall I tell you why? I, sir, and wherefore? For they say every why hath a wherefore. Why first? For flouting me. And then wherefore? For urging it the second time to me. Was there ever a man thus beaten out of season, when in the why and the wherefore is neither rhyme nor reason? Well, sir, I thank you. Thank me, sir, for what? Mary, sir, for the something that you gave me for nothing! I'll make you amends next to give you nothing for something. Say, sir, is it dinner time? No, sir. I think the meat wants that I have. In good time, sir, what's that? Basting. <laughs> well, sir, then twill be dry. If it be, sir, I pray you eat none of it. Your reason? lest it make you choleric and purchase me another dry basting. Well, sir, learn to jest in good time. There's a time for all things. I durst have denied that before you were so choleric. By, by what rule, sir? Mary, sir, by a rule as plain as the plain bald pate of Father Time himself. Let's hear it. There's no time for a man to recover his hair that grows bald by nature. May he not do it by fine and recovery? Yes, to pay a fine for a periwig and recover the lost hair of another man. Why is time such a niggard of hair, being as it is so plentiful an excrement? Because it is a blessing that he bestows on beasts and that he hath scanted men in hair, he hath given them in wit. Well, but there's many a man hath more hair than wit. Not a man of those, but he hath the wit to lose his hair. Why, thou didst conclude hairy men plain dealers without wit. The plainer dealer, the sooner lost. Yet he loseth it in a kind of jollity. For what reason? For two, and sounds one ones too. Nay, not sound, I pray you. Sure ones, then. Nay, not sure in a thing falsely. Certain ones, then. Mm -hmm. The one to save the money that he spends in tiring, the other that at dinner they should not drop in his porridge. You would all this time have proved there is no time for all things. Mary, and did, sir, namely, e'en no time to recover hair loss by nature. But your reason was not substantial why there is no time to recover. Thus I mend it. Time himself is bald, and therefore, to the world's end, will have bald followers. <laughs> I knew to be a bald conclusion, but soft, what wafts us yonder? Enter Adriana, beckoning them, and Luciana. Hi, I, Antiphilus, look strange and frown. Some other mistress hath thy sweet aspects. I am not Adriana, nor thy wife. 
The time was once when thou unurged wouldst vow that never words were music to thine ear, that never object pleasing in thine eye, that never touch well welcome to thy hand, that never meat sweet savored in thy taste, unless I spake or looked or touched or carved to thee. How comes it now, my husband, oh, how comes it that thou art then estranged from thyself? Thyself, I call it, being strange to me, that undividable, incorporate, am better than thy dear self's better part. Ugh, do not tear thyself away from me. For know, my love, as easy mayst thou fall a drop of water in the breaking gulf, and take unmingled thence that drop again without addition or diminishing, as take from me thyself and not me too. How dearly would it touch thee to the quick, shouldst thou but hear I were licentious, and that this body consecrate to thee by ruffian lust should be contaminate. Wouldst thou not spit at me, and spurn at me, and hurl the name of husband in my face, and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow, and from my false hand cut the wedding ring, and break it with a deep divorcing vow? I know thou canst, and therefore see thou do it, I am possessed with an adulterate blot. My blood is mingled with the crime of lust. For if we two be one and thou play false, I do digest the poison of thy flesh, being strumpeted by thy contagion. Keep then fair league and truce with thy true bed. I live disdained, thou undishonored. To me, fair team, I know you not. In Ephesus I am but two hours old. A stranger to your towns, to your talk. Every word, by all my wit being scanned, wants wit in all one word to understand. Fie, brother, how the world is changed with you. When were you wont to use my sister thus? She sent for you by Dromeo home to dinner. By Dromeo? By me? By thee, and this thou didst return from him that he did buffet thee, and in his blows denied my house for his, me for his wife. Did you converse, sir, with this gentlewoman? What is the course and drift of your combat? I, sir, I never saw her till this time. Villain, thou liest, for even her very words didst thou deliver to me on the mart. I never spake with her in all my life. How can she thus then call us by our names? Must it be an inspiration? How ill agrees it with your gravity to counterfeit thus grossly with your slave, abetting him to thwart me in my mood. Be it my wrong you are exempt, you are from me exempt, but wrong not that wrong with more contempt. Come, I will fasten on this sleeve of thine. Thou art an elm, my husband, I a vine, whose weakness married to thy stronger state makes me with thy strength to communicate. If aught possess thee from me, it is dross, usurping ivy, briar, or idle moss, who, all for want of pruning with intrusion, infect thy sap and live on thy confusion. To me she speaks, she moves me for her theme. What, was I married to her in my dream? Or sleep I now and think I hear all this? What error drives our eyes and ears amiss? Until I know this short uncertainty, I'll entertain the offered fallacy. Dromeo, go bid the servants, Brett, for dinner. Oh, for my beads, I cross me for a sinner. This is the fairyland. Oh, spite of spites. We talk with goblins, owls, and sprites. If we obey them not, this will ensue. They'll suck our breath and pinch us black and blue. Why prast thou to thyself and answerest not? Dromeo. Thou, Dromeo, thou snail, thou slug, thou sot. I am transformed, master, am I not? I think thou art in mind, and so am I. Nay, master, both in mind and in my shape. Thou hast thine own form. No, I am an ape. If thou art changed it to aught, tis to an ass. Tis true. She rides me, and I long for grass. Tis so, I am an ass, else it could never be, but I should know her as well as she knows me. Come, come, no longer will I be a fool to put the finger in the eye and weep, whilst man and master laughs my woes to scorn. Come, sir, to dinner. 
Watch, Romeo, keep the gate. Husband, I'll dine above with you today and shrive you of a thousand idle pranks. Sirrah, if any ask you for your master, say he dines forth and let no creature enter. Come, sister. Dromeo, play the porter well. Why in earth, in heaven, or in hell? Sleeping or waking, mad or well advised, known, known unto these and to myself disguised? I'll say as they say, and persever so, and in this mist and all adventures go. Master, shall I be porter at the gate? Aye, and let none enter, lest I break your pate. Come. Come, Antipholus, we dine too late. They exit. End of Act Two. Act Three, Scene One. Enter Antipholus of Ephesus, his man Dromeo of Ephesus, Angelo the goldsmith, and Balthazar the merchant. Good, Signor Angelo. You must excuse us all. My wife is shrewish when I keep not out. Say that I lingered at your shop to see the making of her carcinet and that tomorrow you will bring it home. Uh, but here's a villain that would face me. He met me on the mart, and then I beat him and charged him with a thousand marks in gold, and I did deny my wife and house. Thou drunkard, thou, what didst thou mean by this? Say what you will, sir, but I know what I know, that you... Beat me at the mart. I have your hand to show. If the skin were parchment and the blows you gave were ink, your own handwriting would tell you what I think. I think thou art an ass. Huh. Marry, so it doth appear by the wrongs I suffer and the blows I bear. I should kick being kicked, and being at that pass, you would keep from my heels and beware of an ass. You're sad, Signor Belfazar. Pray God our cheer may answer my goodwill and your good welcome here. I hold your dainties cheap, sir, and you're welcome, dear. Oh, Signor Balthazar, either at flesh or fish, a table full of welcome may scarce one dainty dish. <clears throat> Good meat, sir, is common that every troll affords. And welcome, or common, for that's nothing but words. Full cheer and great welcome makes a merry feast. Aye, to a niggardly host and more sparing guest. My cates be mean, take them in good part. Better cheer may you have, but not with better heart. My door is locked. Go bid them let us in. Maud, Bridget, Marion, Cicely, Gillian, Gin. Moam, Maltorse, Cap'n, Coxcomb, Idiot, Patch. Either get thee from the door or sit down at the hatch. Dost thou conjure for wenches that thou callest for such store? When one is one too many, go, get thee from the door. What? Patch is made our porter. My master stays in the street. Let him walk from whence he came, lest he catch cold on his feet. Who talks with him there? Who? Oh. Right, sir, I'll tell you when, and you tell me wherefore. Wherefore? For my dinner. I have not dined today. Nor today, here you must not. Come again when you may. What art thou that keepest me out from the house I owe? The porter for this time, sir, and my name is Dromeo. Oh, villain! Thou hast stolen both mine office and my name. The one ne'er got me credit, the other mickle blame. If thou hast been Dromeo today in my place, thou wouldst have changed thy face for a name or thy name for an ass. Enter loose, unseen by Antipholus of Ephesus and his company. What a coil is there, Dromeo? Who are those at the gate? Uh, let my master in, loose. Faith, no, he comes too late, and so tell your master. Oh, Lord, I must laugh. Have at you with a proverb. Shall I set in my staff? 
Haven't you with another that? When, can you tell? If thy name be called Luce, Luce thou hast answered him well. Do you hear, you minion? You'll let us in, I hope. I thought to have asked you. And you said no. Ah, oh, so come help. Well struck, there was blow for blow. Thou baggage, let me in. Can you tell for whose sake? Master, knock the door hard. Let him knock till it ache. You'll cry for this minion if I beat the door down. What needs all that in a pair of stocks in the town? Enter Adriana, also unseen. Who is at that at the door that keeps all this noise? By my troth, your town is troubled with unruly boys. Are you there, wife? You might have come before. Your wife, Sir Knave? Go get you from the door. Adriana and Luce exit. If you went in pain, master, this knave would go sore. Here is neither cheer, sir, nor welcome. We would fain have either. In debating what was best, we shall part with neither. They stand at the door, master. Bid them welcome hither. There is something in the wind that we cannot get in. You would say so, master, if your garments were thin. Your cake here is warm within. You stand here in the cold. It would make a man mad as a buck to be so bought and sold. Go, fetch me something. I'll break open the gate. Break any breaking here and I'll break your knave's peat. A man may break a word with you, sir, and words are but wind. Aye, and break it in your face so he break it not behind. It seems thou wantest breaking out upon thee, hind. Oh, he's too much out upon thee. I pray thee, let me in. Ay, when fowls have no feathers and fish have no fin. Well, I'll break in. Go borrow me a crow. A crow without feather. Master, mean you so. For a fish without a fin, there's a fowl without a feather. If a crow help us in, sirrah, we'll pluck a crow together. Go. Get thee gone. Fetch me an iron crow. Mm. Have patience, sir. Oh, let it not be so. Here in your war against your reputation, and draw within the compass of suspect the unviolated honor of your wife. Once this, your long experience of her wisdom, her sober virtue, years and modesty, plead on her part some cause to you unknown. And doubt not, sir, but she will well excuse why at this time the doors are made against you. Be ruled by me, depart in patience, and let us to the tiger or the dinner. And about evening, come yourself alone to know the reason of this strange restraint. If by strong hand you offer to break in, now in the stirring passage of the day, a vulgar comment will be made of it. And that supposed by the common route against your yet ungalled estimation that may with foul intrusion enter in and dwell upon your grave when you are dead dead for slander lives upon succession forever house where it gets possession you have i will depart in quiet and in despite of mirth mean to be merry i know a wench of excellent discourse pretty and witty wild and yet too gentle there we will dine but i mean my wife but i protest without desert, hath often upbraided me with all. To her we will have, to her we will to dinner. Now get you home and fetch the chain. By this I know it is made. Bring it, I pray you, to the porpentine, for there's the house. And I will bestow, be it for nothing but to spite my wife upon mine hostess there. Good sir, make haste, since mine own doors refuse to entertain me, I'll knock elsewhere to see if they'll disdain me.
I'll meet you at the place some hour hence. Do so. This jest shall cost me some expense. They exit. Act three, scene two. Enter Luciana with Antipholus of Syracuse. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antipholus even in the spring of love thy love springs rot? Shall love in building grow so ruinous? If you did wet my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake, use her with more kindness. Or if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth. Muffle your false love with some show of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Be not thy tongue thy own shame's order. Look sweet, speak fair, become disloyalty. Apparel vice like virtue's harbinger. Bear a fair presence, though your heart be tainted. Teach sin the carriage of a holy saint. Be secret false, what need she be acquainted? <laughs> what simple thief brags of his own attaint? Tis double wrong to true out with your bed and let her read it in thy looks at board. Shame hath a bastard fame well managed. Ill deeds is doubled with an evil word. Alas, poor women, make us but believe being compact of credit that you love us. Though others have the arms, show us the sleeve. We in your motion turn and you may move us. Then, gentle brother, get you in again. Comfort my sister, cheer her, call her wife. Tis holy sport to be a little vain when the sweet breath of flattery conquers strife. Sweet mistress, what your name is else I know not, nor by what wonder you do hit of mine, unless in your knowledge and your grace you show not that our earth's wonder, more than earth divine. Teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak, lay open to my earthy gross conceit, smothered in errors, feeble, shallow, weak, the unfolding meaning of your words deceit. Against my soul's pure truth, why labor you to make it wander in an unknown field? Are you a god? Would you create me new? Transform me then, and to your power I'll yield. But if that I am I, then well I know your weeping sister is no wife of mine, nor to her bed no homage do I owe. Far more, far more to you do I incline, do I decline. <laughs> oh, train me not, sweet mermaid, with thy note to drown me in my sister's flood of tears. Sing, siren, for thyself, and I will dote. Spread o'er the silver waves thy golden hairs, and as a bed I'll take them and there lie, and in that glorious supposition think he gains by death that hath such means to die. Let love being light be drowned if she sink. What, are you mad that you do reason so? Not mad, but mated. How, I do not know. It is a fault that springeth from your eye. For gazing on your beams, fair sun being by. <sighs> Gaze when you should, and that will clear your sight. That's good to wink, sweet love, as look on night. Why call you me love? Call my sister so. Thy sister's sister. That's my sister. No, it is thyself, mine own self's better part, my own eyes clear eye, my dear heart's dearer heart, my food, my fortune, and my sweet hopes, eh? my soul, earth's heaven, and my heaven's claim. All this my sister is, or else should be. Oh, thyself, sister sweet, for I am thee. Thee will I love, and with thee lead my life. Thou hast no husband yet, nor I no wife. Give me thy hand. Oh, soft sir, hold you still. I'll fetch my sister to get her goodwill. She exits. Enter Dromeo of Syracuse, running. I how now, Dromeo, where runst thou so fast? Do you know me, sir? Am I Dromeo? Am I your man? Am I myself? Thou art Dromeo, thou art my man, thou art thyself. I am an ass. I am a woman's man, and besides myself. What woman's man, and how besides thyself? Mary, sir, besides myself, I am due to a woman. One that claims me, one that haunts me, one that will have me. What claim lays she to thee? 
marry, sir, such claim as you would lay to your horse, and she would have me as a beast. Not that I, being a beast, she would have me, but that, but that she, being a very beastly creature, lays claim to me. What is she? A very reverend body, I such a one as a man might not speak of without he say, Sir Reverence, I have but lean luck in the match, and yet she is she a wondrous fat marriage. How dost thou mean a fat marriage? Mary, sir, she's the kitchen wench, and all great, <laughs> and I know not what use to put her to, but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. I warrant her rags, and she, and the tallow in them will burn a Poland winter. If she lives till doomsday, she'll burn a week longer than the whole world. What complexion is she of? Swart like my shoe, but her face nothing like so clean kept. For why? She sweats. A man may go over shoes in the grime of it. That's a fault that water will mend. No, sir, tis in grain. Noah's flood could not do it. What's her name? Nell, sir. But her name and three quarters, that's an L in three quarters, will not measure her from hip to hip. <laughs> then she um, bears some breath. No longer than from head to foot than from hip to hip. She is spherical, like a globe. I could find out countries in her. In what part of her body stands Ireland? Mary, sir, in her buttocks. I found it out by the bog. <laughs> Where's Scotland? I found it by the baroness, hard in the palm of the hand. Where France? In her forearm, armed, reverted, making war against the, her heir. Where England? I look for the chalky cliffs, but I can find no whiteness in them. But I guess it stood in her chin, in the salt room that ran between France and it. Where Spain? Faith, I saw it not, but I felt it hot in her breath. Where America, the, the Indies? Oh, sir, upon her nose, all or embellished with rubies, carbuncles, sapphires, declining their rich aspect to the hot breath of Spain, who sent whole armadas of carracks to be ballast at her nose. Where stood Belgium? The Netherlands. Oh, sir, I did not look so low. <laughs> Oh, to conclude, this drudge or diviner laid claim to me, called me Dromeo, swore I was assured to her, told me what privy marks I had about me as the mark on my shoulder, the mole in my neck, the great wart on my left arm, that I, amazed, ran from her as a witch. And I think if my breast had not been made of faith and my heart of steel, she had transformed me to a curdled dog and made me turn the wheel. Oh, hie thee presently, post to the road. And if the wind blow any way from shore, I will not harbor in this town tonight. If any bark put forth, come to the marsh, where I will, where I will walk till thou return to me. If everyone knows us and we know none, tis time, I think, to trudge, pack, and be gone. As from a bear a man would run from life, so fly from her that would be my wife. There's, yeah. none, but, there's none but witches do inhabit here. Therefore, tis high time that I were hence. She that doth call me husband, even my soul doth for a wife abhor. But her fair sister, possessed with such a gentle sovereign grace, of such enchanting presence and discourse, hath almost made me traitor to my son. But lest myself be guilty to self wrong, I'll stop my ears against the mermaid's song. Enter Angelo with the chain. Master Antipolis. Aye, uh, that's my name. I know it well, sir. Lo, here's the chain. I thought to have ta'en you at the porpentine. The chain unfinished made me stay thus long. He gives Antipolis the chain. What is your will that I shall do with this? Uh, why, please yourself, sir, I have made it for you. Made it for me, sir, I bespoke it not. Not once nor twice, but twenty times you have. Go home with it, and please your wife withal, and soon at supper time I'll visit you, and then receive my money for the chain. I pray you, sir, receive the money now, for fear you ne'er see chain nor money more. 
You are a merry man, sir. Fare you well. He exits. What I should think of this, I cannot tell, but this I think. There's no man is so vain that would refuse so fair an offer, Jane. I see a man here needs not live by shifts when in the streets he meets such golden gifts. I will to the mart, and therefore Dromeo stay. If any should put out, then straight away. He exits. End of Act 3. Act 4, Scene 1. Enter a second merchant, Angelo the goldsmith, and an officer. You know since Pentecost the sum is due, and since I have not much importuned you, nor now I have not, but that I am bound to Persia and want guilders for my voyage. Therefore, make present satisfaction, or I'll attach you by this officer. Even just the sum that I do owe to you is growing to me by Antipolis, and in the instant that I met with you, he had of me a chain. At five o'clock I shall receive the money for the same. Please, if you walk with me down to his house, I will discharge my bond and thank you too. Enter Antipolis of Ephesus and Dromeo of Ephesus from the courtesans. While I go to the goldsmith's house, go thou and buy a rope's end. That will I bestow among my wife and her confederates for locking me out of my doors by day. A bit soft. The goldsmith, get thee gone, buy thou a rope and bring it home to me. I buy a thousand pounds a year. I buy a rope. Dromeo exits. A man is well hot that trusts to you. I promised your presence and the, ch the chain nor goldsmith came to me. Belike you thought our love would last too long if it were together and therefore came not. Saving a merry humour, here's the note how much your chain weighs to the utmost carat, the fineness of the gold and chargeful fashion, which doth amount to three odd ducats more than I stand debted to this gentleman. I pray you, see him presently discharged, for he is bound to see and stays but for it. I'm not furnished with the present money. Besides, I have some business in the town. Good, Signor, take and with you take the chain, and bid my wife disperse the sum on the receipt thereof. Perchance I will be there as soon as you. Then you will bring the chain to her yourself? No, bear it with you, lest I come not in time. Well, sir, I will. Have you the chain about you? And if I have not, sir, I hope you have, or else you may return with money. Nay, come, I pray you, sir, give me the chain. Both wind and tide stays for this gentleman, and I, to blame, have held him here too long. Good Lord, you use this dalliance to excuse your poor porcupine. I should have chid you for not bringing it, but like a shrew, you just begin to brawl. The hour steals on. I pray you, sir, dispatch. You hear how he importunes me, the chain. Why, give it to my wife and fetch your money. Come, come, you know I gave it to you even now. Either send the chain or send by me some token. Fie, now run this humour out of breath. Come, where's the chain? I pray you, let me see it. My business cannot brook this dalliance. Good sir, say you where you'll answer me or no. If not, I'll leave him to the officer. I answer you? What should I answer you? The money that you owe me for the chain. I owe you none till I receive the chain. You know I gave it you half an hour since. You gave me none. You wrong me much to say so. You wrong me more, sir, in denying it. Consider how it stands upon my credit. Well, officer, arrest him at my suit. I do, and charge you in the Duke's name to obey me. This touches me in reputation. Either consent to pay this sum for me, or I attach you by this officer. Consent to pay thee that I never had? Arrest me, foolish fellow, if thou darest. Here is thy fee. Arrest him, officer. I would not spare my brother in this case if he should scorn me so apparently. I do arrest you, sir. You hear the suit. I give thee till I give thee bail. But, sirrah, you shall buy this sport as dear as all the metal in your shop will answer. Sir, sir, I shall have law in Ephesus to your notorious shame. I doubt it not. Enter Dromeo of Syracuse from the bay. 
Master, there is a bark of epidamnum that stays but till her owner comes aboard, and then, sir, she bears away. Our frottage, sir, I have conveyed aboard, and I have bought the oil, the balsamum, the aqua vitae. The ship is in her trim, the merry wind blows fair from land. They say not at all, but for their owner, master, and yourself. Oh, no, the madman. Why, thou peevish sheep, what ship of Epidilman stays for me? A ship you sent me to? To hire waftage? Thou drunken slave, I sent thee for a rope and told thee to what purpose and to what end. You sent me for a rope's end as soon. <laughs> you sent me to the bay, sir, for a bark. I will obey this matter at more leisure and teach your ears to list me with more heed. To Adriana, villain, hie thee straight. Give her this key and tell her in the desk that's covered over with Turkish tapestry there is a purse of ducats. Let her send it. Tell her I am arrested in the street and that thou shall bail me. Hi, slave, be gone. On, officer, to prison till it come. To Adriana, that is where we dined, where Dwozabel did claim me for her husband. She is too big, I hope for me to compass. Thither I must, although against my will, for servants must their master's minds fulfill. He exits. Act four, scene two. Enter Adriana and Luciana. Ah, uh, Luciana, did he tempt thee so? Might'st thou perceive austerely in his eye that he did plead in earnest, yea or no? Looked he, or red, or pale, or sad, or merrily? What observation mad'st thou in this case of his heart's meteors tilting in his face? First he denied you had in him no right. He meant he did me none, the more my spite. Then swore he that he was a stranger here. And true he swore, though yet forsworn he were. Then pleaded I for you. And what said he? That love I begged for you, he begged for me. With what persuasion did he tempt thy love? With words that in an honest suit might move. First he did praise my beauty, then my speech. Did speak him fair? Have patience, I beseech. Cannot, nor I will not hold me still. My tongue, though not my heart, shall have his will. He is deformed, crooked, old, and sere. Ill-faced, worse-bodied, shapeless everywhere. Vicious, ungentle, fool, blunt, un uh, blunt, unkind. Stigmatical in making, worse in mind. Who would be jealous then of such a one? No evil lost is wailed when it is gone. Oh, but I think him better than I say, and yet would hear in others' eyes were worse. Far from her nest the lapwing cries away. My heart prays for him, though my tongue do curse. Enter Dromeo of Syracuse with the key. Here go, the desk, the purse sweet, now make haste. How hast thou lost thy breath? By running fast. Where is thy master, Dromeo? Is he well? No, he's in tartar limbo, worse than hell. A dev devil in an everlasting garment hath him, one whose hard heart is buttoned up with steel. A fiend, a fairy, pitiless and rough. A wolf, nay, worse, a fellow in all buff. A back friend, a shoulder clapper, one that countermands the passages of alleys, creeks, and narrow lands. A hound that runs countering yet draws dry foot well. One that before the judgment carries poor souls to hell. Why, man, what is the matter? I do not know the matter. He is rested on the case. What, is he arrested? Tell me at whose suit. I know not at whose suit he is arrested well. But it is in a suit of buff which rested him. That can I tell. Will you send him, mistress, redemption? The money in his desk? Go fetch it, sister. <sighs> this I wonder at, that he, unknown to me, should be in debt. Tell me, was he arrested on a band? Not on a band, but on a stronger thing. A chain, a chain! Do you not hear it ring? What, the chain? No, 
No, the bell, tis time that I were gone. It was two ere I left him, and now the clock strikes one. The hours come back. That did I never hear. Oh, yes, if any hour meet a sergeant, he turns back for very fear. As if time were in debt, how fondly dost thou reason? Time is a very bankrupt and owes more than he's worth to season. Nay, he's a thief, too. Have you not heard men say that time comes stealing on by night and day? If he be in debt and theft and a sergeant in way, hath he not reason to turn back hour in a day? Enter Luciana with a purse. Go, Dromeo, there's the money. Bear it straight and bring thy master home immediately. Dromeo exits. Come, sister, I am pressed down with conceit. Conceit my comfort and my injury. They exit. Act four, scene three. Enter Antipholus of Syracuse, wearing the chain. There's not a man I meet, but doth salute me as if I were their well-acquainted friend. And every one doth call me by my name. Some tender money to me, some invite me, some other give me thanks for kindnesses. Some offer me commodities to buy. Even now a tailor called me in his shop and showed me silks that he had bought for me, and therewithal took measure of my body. Sure, these are but imaginary wiles, and Lapland sorcerers inhabit here. Enter Dromu of Syracuse with the purse. Master, here's the gold you sent me for. What? Have you got the picture of old Adam new apparelled? What gold is this? What, what Adam dost thou mean? Not that Adam that kept the paradise, but that Adam that keeps the prison. He that goes in the calf's skin that was killed for the prodigal. He that came behind you, sir, like an evil angel, and bid you forsake your liberty. I understand thee not. No? Why, tis a plain case. He that went like a base vial in a case of leather. The man, sir, that when gentlemen are tired, gives them a sob and rests. Them. He, sir, that takes pity on decayed men and gives them suits of durance. He that sets up sets his rest to do more exploits with his mace than a Morris Pike. What, thou meanst an officer? Aye, sir, the sergeant of the band, he that brings any man to answer it, that breaks his band, one that thinks a man always going to bed and says, God give you good rest. Well, oh, sir, there rest in your foolery. Is there any ships put forth tonight? May we be gone. Why, sir, I brought you word an hour since that the bark expedition put forth tonight, and then were you hindered by the sergeant to tarry for the hoy, de hoy delay? Here are the angels that you sent for to deliver you. He gives him the purse. I was distracted, and so am I, and here we wander in illusions. Some Blessed power, deliver us from hence. Enter a courtesan. Well met, well met, Master Antiphilus. I see, sir, you have found the goldsmith now. Is that the chain you promised me today? Satan, avoid, I charge thee, tempt me not. Master, is this mistress Satan? It is the devil. Nay, she is worse. She is the devil's dam. And here she comes in the habit of a light wench. And thereof comes that the wenches say, God damn me, that's as much as to say, God make me a light wench. It is written that they appear to men like angels of light. Light is an effect of fire, and fire will burn. Ergo, light wenches will burn. Come not near here. Your man and you are marvelous merry, sir. <laughs> will you go with me? We'll mend our dinner here. Master, if you do expect spoon meat, or bespeak a long spoon. Why, Dromeo? Mary, he must have a long spoon that must eat with the devil. Avoid then, fiend. But tellst thou me of something? Thou art, as you are all a sorceress, I conjure thee to leave me and be gone. Give me the ring of mine you had at dinner, or for my diamond the chain you promised, and I'll be gone, sir, and not trouble you. Some devils ask but the parings of one's nail. A rush, a hair, a drop of blood, a pin, a nut, a cherry stone. But she, more covetous, would have a chain. Master, be wise, and if you give it her, the devil will shake her chain and fright us with it. I pray you, sir, my ring or else the chain. I hope you don't, do not mean to cheat me so. A font, thou witch! Come, Dromeo, let us go. 
Spy pride, says the peacock. Mistress, that you know. Antipholus and Dromeo exit. Now out of doubt Antipholus is mad, else he would never so demean himself. A ring he hath of mine worth forty ducats, and for the same he promised me a chain. Both one or the other he denies me now, the reason that I gather he is mad. Besides this present instance of his rage is a mad tale he told today at dinner, of his own doors being shut against his entrance. <laughs> Be like his wife, acquainted with his fits, on purpose shut the doors against his way. My way is now to hie home to his house, and tell his wife that, being lunatic, he rushed into my house and took perforce my ring away. This course I fittest choose, for forty ducats is too much to lose. She exits. Act four, scene four. Enter Antipholus of Ephesus with a jailer, the officer. Fear me not, man. I will not break away. I'll give thee, ere I leave, so much money to warrant thee as I am arrested for. My wife is in a wayward mood today and will not lightly trust the messenger that I should be attached in Ephesus. I tell you, twill sound harshly in her ears. Enter Dromeo of Ephesus with a rope's end. Ah, here comes my man. I think he brings the money. How now, sir, have you that I sent you for? Uh, here's that. I warrant you will pay them all. But where's the money? Why, sir, I gave the money for the rope. Five hundred ducats, villain, for a rope. I'll serve you, sir, five hundred at the rate. To what end did I bid thee hie thee home? To a rope's end, sir, and to that end I am, am I returned. And to that end, sir, I will welcome you. Oh. Good sir, be patient. Nay, tis for me to be patient. I am in adversity. Good now, hold thy tongue. Nay, rather persuade him to hold his hands. That a whoresome, senseless villain. Oh, I would I were senseless, sir, that I might not feel your blows. <sighs> Thou art sensible in nothing but blows, and so is an ass. I am an ass, indeed. You may prove it by my long ears. I have served him from the hour of my nativity to this instant, and have nothing in his hand to my service but blows. When I am cold, he heats me for my, by, with beating. When I am warm, he cools me with beating. I am waked with it when I sleep, raised with it when I sit, driven out of doors with it when I go from home, welcomed home with it when I return. Nay, I bear it on my shoulders as a beggar want her brat. And I think when he hath lamed me, I shall beg with it from door to door. Enter Adriana, Luciana, the courtesan, and a schoolmaster called Pinch. Come, go along. My wife is coming yon. Mistress, respice finem, respect your end, or, or rather the prophecy like the parrot, for where the ropes end. Wilt thou still talk? How say you now? Is not your husband mad? His incivility confirms no less. Good Dr. Pinch, you are a conjurer. Establish him in his true sense again, and I will please you what you demand. Alas, how fiery and how sharp he looks. Mark how he trembles in his ecstasy. Give me your hand. Let me feel your pulse. Well, here is my hand. Let it feel your ear. I charge thee, Satan, housed within this man, to yield possession to my holy prayers, and to thy state of darkness hie thee straight. I conjure thee by all the saints in heaven. Peace, doting wizard. Peace, I am not mad. Oh, that thou wert not poor distressed soul. Dominion you. Are these your... Did this companion with the saffron face revel and feast it at my house today? Upon me, the guilty doors were shut and I denied to enter in my house. Oh, husband, God know you... God doth know you dined at home, where you would have remained until this time, free from these slanders and this open shame. Dined at home? Thou villain, what sayest thou? 
Sir, sooth to say, you did not dine at home. Were not my doors locked up and I shut out? Purdy, your doors were locked and you shut out. And did not she herself revile me there? Sans fable, she herself reviled you there. And did not her kitchen maid rail haunt and me? Certainly she did. The kitchen vestal scorned you. Enraged, depart from hence. Oh, in verity you did. My bones bear witness that since have felt the vigour of his rage. <sighs> it's good to soothe him in these contraries. It is no shame. The fellow finds his vein and, yielding to him, humours well his frenzy. How has suborned the goldsmith to arrest me? Alas, I sent you money to redeem you by Dromeo here, who came in haste for it. Uh, money by me? Heart and goodwill you might, but surely, master, not a rag of money. Were it not thou to her for a purse of ducats? He came to me and I delivered it. And I am witness with her that she did. A god and the rope maker bear me witness that I was sent for nothing but a rope. Mistress, both man and master is possessed. I know it by their pale and deadly looks. They must be bound and laid in some dark room. Say wherefore didst thou lock me forth today? And why dost thou deny the bag of gold? I did not, gentle husband, lock thee forth. And gentle master, I received no gold. But I confess, sir, that we were locked out. Dissembling villain, thou speak'st false in both. Dissembling harlot, thou art false in all, and art confederate with a damned pack to make a lonesome adjoin of me. But with these nails, I'll pluck out those false eyes and would behold in me this shameful sport. Oh, bind him, bind him, let him not come near me. To three or four who offer to bind him, he strives. More company, the fiend is strong within him. Ay, me, poor man, how pale and wan he looks. What will you murder me? Thou jailer, thou, I am thy prisoner. Wilt thou suffer then to make a rescue? Masters, let him go. He is my prisoner, and you shall not have him. Go, so, find this man, for he is frantic what? too. Romeo is bound. <laughs> what wilt thou do, thou peevish officer? Hast thou delight to see a wretched man do outrage and displeasure to himself? He is my prisoner. If I let him go, the debt he owes will be required of me. I will discharge the heir ere I go from thee. Bear me forthwith until his creditor, and knowing how the debt grows, I will pay it. Good master doctor, see him safe conveyed home to my house. Oh, most unhappy day. Oh, most unhappy strumpet. Master, I am here entered in bond for you. Out on thee, villain, why for dost thou mad me? Will you be bound for nothing? Oh, be mad, good master, cry the devil. God help, poor souls, how idly do they talk. Go bear him hence. Finch and his men exit with Antipholus and Dromeo of Ephesus. The officer, Adriana, Luciana, and the courtesan remain. Sister, go you with me. Say now whose suit he is arrested at. One Angelo, a goldsmith. Do you know him? I know the man. What is the sum he owes? Two hundred ducats. Say, how grows it due? For a chain your husband had of him. He did bespeak a chain for me, but had it not. When as your husband all in rage today came to my house and took away my ring, the ring I saw upon his finger now straight after did I meet him with a chain. It may be so, but I never did see it. Come, jailer, bring me where the goldsmith is. I long to know the truth hereof of large. Enter Antipholus of Syracuse with his rapier drawn and Dromeo of Syracuse. God, for thy mercy, they're loose again! And come with naked swords, let's call more help to have them bound again. Away! They'll kill us! Run all out as fast as may be, frighted. Antipholus and Dromeo of Syracuse remain. See, these witches are afraid of swords. 
He that would be your wife now ran from you. Come to the centaur. Fetch our stuff from thence. I long that we were safe and sound aboard. Faith, stay here this night. They will surely do us no harm. You saw they speak us fair, give us gold. Methinks they are such a gentle nation that, but for the mountain of mad flesh that claims marriage of me, I could find it in my heart to stay here still and turn witch. I will not stay tonight for all the town. Therefore, away to get our stuff aboard. They exit. End of Act 4. Act 5. Scene 1. Enter the second merchant and Angelo the goldsmith. I am sorry, sir, that I have hindered you, but I protest he had the chain of me, though most dishonestly did he doth deny it. How is the man esteemed here in the city? A very reverend reputation, sir, of credit infinite, highly beloved, second to none that lives here in the city. His word might bear my wealth at any time. Speak softly. Yonder, I, I think he walks. Enter Antipholus and Dromeo of Syracuse again, Antipholus wearing the chain. Tis so, and that self chain about his neck, which he forswore most monstrously to have. Good sir, draw near to me, I'll speak to him. Signor Antipholus, I wonder much that you would put me to this shame and trouble, and not without some scandal to yourself, with circumstance and oaths so to deny this chain, which now you wear so openly. Besides the charge, the shame, imprisonment, you have done wrong to this my honest friend, who, but for staying on our controversy, had hoisted sail and put to sea today. This chain you had of me, can you deny it? I think I had. Uh, I never did deny it. Yes, that you did, sir, and forswore it too. Who heard me to deny it or forswear it? Uh, these ears of mine. Thou knowest, d did thee hear thee? Fie on thee, wretch. Tis pity that thou livest to walk where any honest man resort. Thou art a villain to impeach me thus. I will prove my honor and mine honesty against thee presently, if thou darest stand. I dare, and I do defy thee for a villain. They draw, as Adriana, Luciana, the courtesan, and others enter. Hold, hurt him not, for God's sake. He is mad. Some get within him. Take his sword away. Bind Dromeo too, and bear them to my house. Run, master, run, for God's sake. Take a house. This is some priory in, or we are spoiled. Antipholus and Romeo of Syracuse exit to the priory as the Lady Abbess enters. Most mighty duke, behold a man much wronged. Wherefore throng you hither? To fetch my poor distracted husband hence. Let us come in that we may bind him fast and bear him home for his recovery. I knew he was not in his perfect wits. I, I am sorry now that I did draw on him. How long hath this possession held the man? This week he hath been heavy, sour, sad, and much different from the man he was. But till this afternoon his passion ne'er break into extremity of rage. Hath he not lost much wealth by rack of sea, buried some dear friend? Hath not else his eye strayed his affection in unlawful love, a sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the liberty of gazing? Which of these sorrows is he subject to? To none of these except it be the last, namely, some love that drew him off from home. You should, for that, have reprehended him. Why, so I did. I, but not rough enough. As roughly as my modesty would let me. Happily in private. And in assemblies, too. I, but not enough. It was the copy of our conference. In bed he slept not for my urging it, at board he fed not for my urging it. Alone it was the subject of my theme. In company I often glanced at it. Still did I tell him it was vile and bad. And thereof came it that the man was mad, the venom clamors of a jealous woman, 
poisons more deadly than a mad dog's tooth. It seems his sleeps were hindered by thy railing, and thereof comes it that his head is light. Thou sayst his meat was sauced with thy upbraidings. Unquiet meals make ill digestions, thereof the raging fire of fever bred. And what's a fever but a fit of madness? Thou sayest his sports were hindered by thy brawls, sweet recreation barred. What doth ensue but moody and dull melancholy? Kinsman, to grim and comfortless despair, and at her heels a huge infectious troop of pale distemperatures and foes to life. In food, in sport, and life-preserving rest, to be disturbed with mad or man or beast, the consequence is then thy jealous fits hath scared thy husband from the use of wits. She never reprended him, but mildly, when he demeaned himself rough, rude, and wildly. Why bear you these rebukes and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people enter and lay hold on him. No, not a creature enters in my house. Then let your servants bring my husband forth. Neither. He took this place for sanctuary, and it shall privilege him from your hands till I have brought him to his wits again, or lose my labor in a saying it. I will attend my husband. Be his nurse, diet his sickness, for it is my office, and will have no attorney but myself. And therefore let me have him home with him, with me. Be patient for I will not let him stir till I have used the approved means I have with wholesome syrups, drugs, and holy prayers to make of him a formal man again. It is a branch and parcel of mine oath, a charitable duty of my order. Therefore, depart and leave him here with me. I will not hence and leave my husband here. And ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife. Be quiet and depart. Thou shalt not have him. He exits. Complain unto the duke of this indignity. Come, go. I will fall prostrate at his feet and never rise until my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person. And hither and take perforce my husband from the abbess. By this, I think the dial points at five. Anon, I I'm sure the Duke himself in person comes this way to the melancholy vale, the place of death and sorry execution behind the ditches of the abbey here. Upon what cause? To see a reverend Syracusian merchant who put unluckily into this bay against the laws and statutes of this town, beheaded publicly for his offense. See where they come. We will behold his death. Kneel to the Duke before he pass the abbey. Enter the Duke of Ephesus, and Aegean the merchant of Syracuse, bare head with the headsmen and other officers. Yet once again proclaim it publicly. If any friend will pay the sum for him, he shall not die. So much we tender him. Justice, most sacred Duke, against the abbess. She is a virtuous and a reverend lady. It cannot be that she hath done thee wrong. May it please your grace, Antiphilus, my husband, who I made lord of me, and all I had at your important letters, this ill day a most outrageous fit of madness took him, that desperately he hurried through the street, with him his bondsmen, all as mad as he, doing displeasure to the citizens by rushing in their houses, bearing thence rings, jewels, anything his rage did like. Once did I get him bound and sent him home, whilst to take order for the wrongs I went that here, and there his fury had committed. Anon I wot not by what strong escape he broke from those that had the guard of him, and with his mad attendant and himself, each one with ireful passion, with drawn swords, met us again and madly bent on us, chased us away till raising of more aid, we came again. 
again to bind them. Then they fled into this abbey whither we pursued them. And here the abbess shuts the gates on us and will not suffer us to fetch him out, nor send him forth that we may bear him hence. Therefore, most gracious duke, with thy command, let him be brought forth and borne hence for help. Long since thy husband served me in my wars, and I to thee engaged a prince's word when thou didst make him master of thy dead, to do him all the grace and good I could. Go, some of you, knock at the abbey gate, and bid the lady abbess come to me. I will determine this before I stir. Enter a messenger. Oh, mistress, mistress, shift and save yourself. My master and his men are both broke loose, beaten the maids of woe and found the doctor, whose beard, whose beard they had singed off with brands of fire. And ever as it blazed, they threw on him great pails of puddle mire to quench the hair. My master preaches patience to him, and the while his man with scissors licked him like a fool. And sure, unless you send some present help, between them they will kill the conjurer. Peace, fool, thy master and his man are here, and that is false thou dost report to us. Mistress, upon my life I tell you true. I have not breathed or almost since I did see it. He cries for you and vows. If he can take you, to scorch your face, and to disfigure you. Hark! Hark! I hear him, mistress! Be gone! Be gone! Come, stand by me. Fear nothing. Guard with Helbids. Enter Antiphilus and Dromeo of Ephesus. Hi, me, it is my husband. Witness you that he is born about invisible. Even now we housed him in the abbey here, and now he's there past thought of human reason. Justice, most gracious you, O grand justice, even for the service that long since I did thee when I stood in the wall and took deep scars to thy, even for that I lost for thee, now just. Thus the fear of death doth make me doubt. I see my son Antiphus and Dromeo. Justice, sweet prince, against that woman there, she whom thou wast to me to be my wife, that hath abused and dishonoured me, even in the strength and height of injury beyond imagination is the wrong that she this day has shameless thrown on me. Discover how? and thou shalt find me dirt, thus, just. This day, great duke, she shut the doors upon me, while she with harlots feasted in my house. A grievous fault. Say, woman, didst thou so? No, my good lord. Myself, he, and my sister today did dine together. So befall my soul, as this is false, he burdens me withal. Ne'er may I look on day nor sleep on night, but she tells to you your highness simple truth. Oh, perjured woman, they are both forsworn. In this the madman justly chargeth them. My liege, I am advised what I say, neither disturbed with the effect of wine, nor head nor heady rash provoked with raging ire. My, My liege, liege, I am advised what I say. Neither disturbed with the effect of wine, nor heady rash provoked with raging ire, albeit my wrongs might make one wiser mad. This woman locked me out this day from dinner. That goldsmith there, were he not packed with her, could witness it, for he was with me then, who parted with me to go fetch a chain, promising to bring it to the Porpentine, where Balthazar and I did dine together. Our dinner done, and he not coming thither, I went to seek him. In the street I met him, and in his company, that gentleman. There did this perjured goldsmith swear me down that I this day of him received the chain. Uh, 
the chain, which God he knows I saw not, for the which he did arrest me with an officer. I did obey and sent my peasant home for certain ducats. He with none returned. Then fairly I bespoke the officer to go in person with me to my house. By the way, we met my wife, her sister, and a rabble more of vile confederates. Along with them, one brought, they brought one pinch, a hungry, lean-faced villain, a mere anatomy, a mountain bank, a threadbare juggler, and a fortune teller, a neat, hollow-eyed, sharp-looking wench, a living dead man. The pernicious slave, forsook, took on him as a conjurer, and gazing in mine eyes, feeling my pulse, and with no face as it were, outfacing me, cries out I was possessed. Then altogether they fell upon me, bound me, bore me thence, and in dark, dankish vault at home, there left me and my man, both bound together, till gnawing with my teeth, my bonds in sunder, I gained my freedom and immediately ran hither to your grace, whom I beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities. My lord, in truth thus far I witness with him, that he dined not at home, but was locked out. But had he such a chain of thee or no? He had, my lord, and when he ran in here, these people saw the chain about his neck. Besides, I will be sworn of these ears of mine. Uh, heard you confess you had the chain of him after you first forswore it on the mart, and thereupon I drew my sword on you, and then you fled into this abbey here, from whence I think you are come by miracle. I never these, nor ever didst thou draw thy sword on me. I never saw the chain, so help me heaven, and this is false you burden me with all. Why, what an intricate impeach is this? I think you all have drunk of Circe's cup. If here you housed him, here he would have been. If he were mad, he would not plead so coldly. You say he dined at home. The goldsmith here denies that saying. Sirrah, what say you? Sirrah, he dined with her at the Porpentine. He did, and from my finger snatched that ring. Tis true, my liege, this ring I had of her. Sawst thou him enter at the, the abbey here? As sure, my liege, as I do see your grace. <sighs> Why, this is strange. Go call the abbess hither. I think you all are mated or stark mad. Most mighty duke, vouchsafe me speak a word. Happily, I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that may deliver me. Speak freely, Syracusian, what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called Antiphilus? And is that not, and is that not your bondman, Dromio? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir, but he, I thank him, gnawed in two my cords. Now I am Dromio, and his man, unbound. I'm sure both of you, both of you remember me. Ourselves we do remember, sir. But you, for lately we were bound as you are now. You are not Pinch's patient, are you, sir? Why look you strange on me? You know me well. I never saw you in my life till now. Oh, grief hath changed me since you last saw me, and careful hours with time's deformed hand have ridden strange to features in my face. But tell me yet, dost thou not know my voice? Neither. Dromeo, nor thou? No, trust me, sir, nor I. I am sure thou hast dust. I, sir, but I am sure I do not, and whatsoever a man denies, you are now bound to believe him. Not know my voice. O time's extremity, hast thou cracked and splitted my poor tongue in seven short years that here my only son knows not my feeble key of untuned Heirs, though now this green face of mine be hidden some sap consuming winter's drizzled snow, and all the conduits of my blood froze up, yet hath my night of life some memory, my wasting lamp some fading glimmer left, my dull deaf ears a little used to hear, all these old witnesses I can't err. Tell me thou art my son Antiphilus. 
I never saw my father in my life. But seven years since, and Sir Cusia, boy, thou knowst we parted. But perhaps, my son, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke, and all that know me in the city, can witness with me that is not so. I never saw Sir Cusia in my life. I tell thee, Sir Cusian, twenty years have I been patron to Antipholus, during which time he ne'er saw Syracusa. I see thy age and dangers make thee dote. Enter Amelia the Abbess with Antipholus of Syracuse and Dromeo of Syracuse. Most mighty duke, behold a man much wronged. I see two husbands, or mine eyes deceive me. One of these men is genius to the other, and so of these, which is the natural man and which the spirit? Who deciphers them? I, sir, am Dromeo. Command him away. I, sir, am Dromeo. Pray let me stay. Aegean art thou not, or, or else his ghost. Oh, my old master! Who hath bound him here? Ever bound him. I will loose his bonds and gain a husband by his liberty. Speak, old Aegean, if thou beest the man that hadst a wife once called Amelia, that bore thee at a burden two fair sons. Oh, if thou beest the same Aegean, speak and speak unto the same Amelia. Why, here begins his morning story right. These two Antipholus, these two so like, and these two Dromios, one in semblance, besides her urging of her rack at sea. These are the parents to these children, which accidentally are met together. I dream not thou art Amelia. If thou art she, tell me, where is that son that floated with thee on the fatal raft? By men of Epidamium, he and I, and the twin Dromio, all were taken up, but by and by, rude fishermen of Corinth by force took Dromeo and my son from them, and me they left with those of Epidamium. What then became of them, I cannot tell. I to this fortune that you see me in. Antiphilus? Thou camest from Corinth first. Uh, no, sir, not I. I. I came from Syracuse. <sighs> Say, stand apart. I know not which is which. I came from Corinth, my most gracious lord. And I with him. Brought to this town by that most famous warrior, Duke Menethon, your most renowned uncle. Which of you two did dine with me today? I, gentle mistress. And are you not my husband? I say nay to that. And so do I, yet did she call me so. And this fair gentlewoman, her sister here, did call me brother. What I told you then, I hope I shall have leisure to make good, if this be not a dream I see and hear. That is the chain, sir, which you had of me. I think it be, sir, I deny it not. And you, sir, for this chain arrested me. I think I did, sir, I deny it not. I sent you money, sir, to be your bail by Dromeo, but I think he brought it not. No, none by me. Is this purse of ducats I received from you? And Dromeo, my man, did bring them me. See, we still did meet each other's man. And I was taken for him, and he for me, and thereupon these errors are rose. Those ducats pawn I for my father here. <laughs> It shall not need. Thy father has his life. Sir, I must have that diamond from you. There, take it, and much thanks for my good cheer. Renowned Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains to go with us into the abbey here, and here at large discourse it all our fortunes, and all that are assembled in this place, that by this sympathized one day's error, have suffered wrong. Go, keep us company, and we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years have I but gone in travail of you, my sons, until this present hour, 
my heavy burden ne'er delivered the duke my husband and my children both and you the calendars of their nativity go to a gossip's feast and go with me after so long a grief such nativity with all my heart i'll gossip at this feast all exit except the two Dromeos and the two brothers Antipolis. Master, shall I fetch your stuff from shipboard? Dromeo, what stuff of mine hast thou embarked? Your goods that lay at host, sir, in the centaur. He speaks to me. I am your master, Dromeo. Come, go with us. We'll look to that anon. Embrace thy brother there. Rejoice with him. The brothers Antipolis exit. There is a fat friend at your master's house that kitchened me for you today at dinner. She now shall be my sister, not my wife. Me thinks you are my glass and not my brother. Oh, I see by you I'm a sweet faced you. <laughs> Will you walk in to see their gossiping? Oh, not I, sir. You are my elder. Oh, that's a question. How shall we try it? Yeah, we'll draw cuts for the senior. Till then, lead thou first. Uh, nay, then, thus. We came into the world like brother and brother. And now let's go hand in hand, not one before the other. They exit. End of play. Thank you Yay! for joining us for Comedy of Errors. We would once again like to extend a very large thank you to our friend, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare. Visit him at his website, uh, shakespeareproofs.com or on Facebook at Shakespeare Proofs, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare. Links to all that in the comments of this video. Um, a huge thanks to all of these fine actors for appearing with us. Thank you all so much. Uh, so many actors from three different continents joined us tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want more information on us, including how to be one of these fine actors, you can go to our Facebook page, Zenith Players, and send us a message, or send an email to casting at zenithplayers.com, and our technical director, that's me, will get back to you as soon as possible. We want to continue to express our support to everyone out there who is working to keep us all safe and those continuing to protest and demonstrate. Join us this Monday as we uh, read Medea and next Saturday, we will be reading Prometheus Bound. Thank you and good night.